Eros and Civilization, a Philosophical Inquiry into Freud by Herbert Marcuse. This is Chapter 5, Philosophical Interlude. Freud's theory of civilization grows out of his psychological theory. Its insights into the historical process are derived from the analysis of the mental apparatus of the individuals who are the living substance of history. This approach penetrates the protective ideology insofar as it views the cultural institutions in terms of what they have made of the individuals through whom they function. But the psychological approach seems to fail at a decisive point. History has progressed behind the back and over the individuals, and the laws of the historical process have been those governing the reified institutions rather than the individuals. Against this criticism, we have argued that Freud's psychology reaches into a dimension of the mental apparatus where the individual is still the genus, the present still the past. Freud's theory reveals the biological de-individualization beneath the sociological one, the former proceeding under the pleasure and nirvana principles, the latter under the reality principle. By virtue of this generic conception, Freud's psychology of the individual is per se psychology of the genus. And his generic psychology unfolds the vicissitudes of the instincts as historical vicissit vicissitudes, <laughs> the recurrent dynamic of the struggle between eros and death instinct, of the building and destruction of culture, of repression and the return of the repressed is released and organized by the historical conditions under which mankind develops. But the metaphysical implications of Freud's theory go even beyond the framework of sociology. Their primary instincts pertain to life and death, that is to say, to organic matter as such, and they link organic matter back with unorganic matter and forward with its higher mental manifestations. In other words, Freud's theory contains certain assumptions on the structure of the principal mode of being. It contains ontological implications. This chapter attempts to show that these implications are more than formal, that they pertain to the basic context of Western philosophy. According to Freud, civilization begins with the, metho myth the methodical inhibition of the primary instincts. Two chief modes of instinctual organization may be distinguished. A, the inhibition of sexuality ensuing in durable and expanding group relations, and B, the inhibition of the destructive instincts leading to the mastery of man and nature, to individual and social morality. As the combination of these two forces sustains ever more effectively the life of ever larger groups, Eros gains over his adversary. Social utilization presses the death instinct into the service of the life instincts. But the very progress of civilization increases the scope of sublimation and of controlled aggression. On both accounts, eros is weakened and destructive destructiveness is released. This would suggest that progress remains committed to a regressive trend in the instinctual structure. In the last analysis to the death instinct, that the growth of civilization is counteracted by the persistent, though repressed, impulse to come to rest in final gratification. Domination and the enhancement of power and productivity proceed through destruction beyond rational necessity. The question for liberation is darkened by the quest for nirvana. The sinister hypothesis that, cult that culture via the socially utilized impulses stands under the rule of the nirvana principle has often haunted psychoanalysis. Progress contains regression. From his notion of the trauma of birth, Otto Rank came to the conclusion that culture establishes on an ever larger scale protective shells which reproduce the intrauterine state. Every comfort that civilization and technical knowledge continually strive to increase only tries to replace by durable substitutes, the primal goal from which it becomes ever further removed. Ferenczi's theory, especially his idea of a genitofugal libido, tends to the same conclusion. 
and Geza Roheim consider the danger of object loss of being left in the dark as one of the decisive instinctual motives in the evolution of culture. The persistent strength of the Nirvana principle in civilization illuminates the scope of the constraints placed upon the culture building power of Eros. Eros creates culture in his struggle against the death instinct. He strives to preserve being on an ever larger and richer scale in order to satisfy the life instincts, to protect them from the threat of non-fulfillment extinction. It is the failure of Eros, lack of fulfillment in life, which enhances the instinctual value of death. The manifold forms of regression are unconscious protest against the insufficiency of civilization against the prevalence of toil over pleasure, performance over gratification. An innermost tendency in the organism militates against the principle which has governed civilization and insists on return from alienation. The derivatives of the death instinct join the neurotic and perverted manifestations of Eros in this rebellion. Time and again, Freud's theory of civilization points up these counter trends. Destructive as they appear in the light of the established culture, they testify to the destructiveness of what they strive to destroy, repression. They aim not only against the reality principle, at non-being, but also beyond the reality principle, at another mode of being. They betoken the historical character of the reality principle, the limits of its validity and necessity. At this point, Freud's metapsychology meets a mainstream of Western philosophy. As the scientific rationality of Western civilization began to bear its full fruit, it became increasingly conscious of its psychical implications. The ego which undertook the rational transformation of the human and natural environment revealed itself as an essentially aggressive, offensive subject, whose thoughts and actions were designed for mastering objects. It was a subject against an object. This a priori antagonistic experience defined the ego cogitans as well as the ego agents. Nature, its own as well as the external world, were given to the ego as something that had to be fought, conquered, and even violated. Such was the precondition for self-preservation and self-development. The struggle begins with the perpetual internal conquest of the lower faculties of the individual his sensuous and appetitive faculties. Their subjugation is, at least since Plato, regarded as a constitutive element of human reason, which is thus in its very function repressive. The struggle culminates in the conquest of external nature, which must be perpetually attacked, curbed, and exploited in order to yield to human needs. The ego experiences being as provocation, as project, it experiences each ex existential condition as a restraint that has to be overcome, transformed into another one. The ego becomes preconditioned for mastering action and productivity even prior to any specific occasion that calls for such an attitude. Max Scheller has pointed out that the conscious or unconscious impulse or will to power over nature is the primum movens in the relation of the modern individual to being, and that it structurally precedes modern science and technology, a pre and a logical antecedent before scientific thought and intuition. Nature is a priori experienced by an organism bent to domination and therefore experienced as susceptible to mastery and control. And consequently, work is a priori power and provocation in the struggle with nature. It is overcoming of resistance. In such work attitude, the images of the objective world appear as symbols for points of aggression. Action appears as domination and reality per se as resistance. <coughs> Scheller calls this mode of thought knowledge geared to domination and achievement and sees in it the specific mode of knowledge which has guided the development of modern civilization. It has shaped the predominant notion, not only of the ego, the thinking and acting subject, but also of its objective world. 
the notion of being as such. Whatever the implications of the original Greek conception of logos as the essence of being, since the canonization of the Aristotelian logic, the term merges with the idea of ordering, classifying, mastering reason. And this idea of reason becomes increasingly antagonistic to those faculties and attitudes which are receptive rather than productive, which tend toward gratification rather than transcendence, which remain strongly committed to the pleasure principle. They appear as the unreasonable and irrational that must be conquered and contained in order to serve the progress of reason. Reason is to ensure, through the ever more effective transformation and exploitation of nature, the fulfillment of the human potentialities. But in the process, the end seems to recede before the means. The time devoted to alienated labor absorbs the time for individual needs and defines the needs themselves. The Logos uh, shows forth as the logic of domination. When logic then reduces the units of thought to signs and symbols, the laws of thought have finally become techniques of cultivation or of calculation and manipulation. But the logic of domination does not triumph unchallenged. The philosophy which epitomizes the antagonistic relation between subject and object also retains the image of their reconciliation. The restless labor of the transcending subject terminates in the ultimate unity of subject and object, the idea of being in and for itself, existing in its own fulfillment. The logos of gratification contradicts the logos of alienation. The effort to harmonize the two animates the inner history of Western metaphysics. It obtains its classical formulation in the Aristotelian hierarchy of the modes of being, which culminates in the new theos. Its existence is no longer defined and confined by anything other than itself, but is entirely itself in all states and conditions. The ascending curve of becoming is bent in the circle which moves in itself. Past, present, and future are enclosed in the ring. According to Aristotle, this mode of being is reserved to the god. And the movement of thought, pure thinking, is its sole empirical approximation. Otherwise, the empirical world does not partake of such fulfillment, only a yearning. Eros-like connects this world with its end in itself. The Aristotelian concept is not a religious one. The nous theos is, as it were, part of the universe, neither its creator, nor its lord, nor its savior, but a mode of being in which all potentiality is actuality, in which the project of being has been fulfilled. The Aristotelian conception remains alive through all subsequent transformations, when at the end of the age of reason with Hegel, Western thought makes its last and greatest attempt to demonstrate the validity of its categories and of the principles which govern its world. It concludes again with the new theos. Again, fulfillment is relegated to the absolute idea and to absolute knowledge. Again, the movement of the circle ends the painful process of destructive and productive transcendence. Now the circle comprises the whole. All alienation is justified and at the same time cancelled in the universal ring of reason, which is the world. But now philosophy comprehends the concrete historical ground on which the edifice of reason is erected. The phenomenology of the spirit unfolds the structure of reason as the structure of domination and as the overcoming of domination. Reason develops through the developing self-consciousness of man who conquers the natural and historical world it makes it the material of his self-realization. When mere consciousness reaches the stage of self-consciousness, it finds itself as ego, and the ego is first desire. It can become conscious of itself only through satisfying itself in and by an other. But such satisfaction involves the negation of the other, for the ego has to prove itself by truly being for itself against all otherness. This is the notion of the individual which must constantly assert and affirm himself in order to be real, which is set off against the world as his negativity, as denying his freedom, 
so that he can exist only by incessantly winning and testing his existence against something or someone which contests it. The ego must become free. But if the world has the character of negativity, then the ego's freedom depends on being recognized, acknowledged as master, and such recognition can only be tendered by another ego, another self-conscious subject. <clears throat> Objects are not alive. The overcoming of their resistance cannot satisfy or test the power of the ego. Self-consciousness can attain its satisfaction only in another self-consciousness. The aggressive attitude toward the object world, the domination of nature, thus ultimately aims at the domination of man by man. It is aggressiveness towards the other subjects. Satisfaction of the ego is conditioned upon its negative relation to another ego. The relation of both self-consciousness is in this way so constituted that they prove themselves and each other through a life and death struggle, and it is solely by risking life that freedom is obtained. Freedom involves the risk of life, not because it involves liberation from servitude, but because the very content of human freedom is defined by the mutual negative relation to the other. And since this negative relation affects the totality of life, freedom can be tested only by staking life itself. Death and anxiety, not as fear for this element or that, not for this or that moment of time, but as fear for one's entire being are the essential terms of human freedom and satisfaction. From the negative structure of self-consciousness results the relation of master and servant, domination and servitude. This relation is the consequence of the specific nature of self-consciousness and the consequence of its specific attitude toward the other, object and subject. But the phenomenology of the spirit would not be the self-interpretation of Western civilization if it were nothing more than the development of the logic of domination. The phenomenology of the spirit leads to the overcoming of that form of freedom which derives from the antagonistic relation to the other. And the true mode of freedom is not the incessant activity of conquest, but its coming to rest in the transparent knowledge and gratification of being. The ontological climate which prevails at the end of the phenomenology is the very opposite of the Promethean dynamic. The wounds of the spirit heal without leaving scars. The deed is not everlasting. The spirit takes it back into itself, and the aspect of particularity, individuality, present, present in it, immediately passes away. Mutual acknowledgement and recognition are still the test for the reality of freedom but the terms are now forgiveness and reconciliation. The word of reconciliation is the objectively existent spirit which apprehends in its opposite the pure knowledge of itself, qua universal essence, a mutual recognition, which is absolute spirit. These formulations occur at the decisive place where Hegel's analysis of the manifestations of the spirit has reached the position of the self-conscious spirit, its being in and for itself. Here, the negative relation to the other is ultimately in the existence of the spirit as new, transformed into productivity, which is receptivity, activity, which is fulfillment. Hegel's presentation of his system in his encyclopedia ends on the word enjoys. The philosophy of Western civilization culminates in the idea that the truth lies in the negation of the principle that governs this civilization. Negation in the twofold sense that freedom appears as really only in the idea, and that the endlessly projecting and transcending productivity of being comes to fruition in the perpetual peace of self conscious receptivity. The phenomenology of the spirit throughout preserves the tension between the ontological and the historical content. The manifestations of the spirit are the main stages of Western civilization but these historical manifestations remain affected with negativity. The spirit comes to itself only in and as absolute knowledge. It is at the same time the true form of thought and the true form of being. Being is in its very essence reason, but the highest form of reason is to Hegel almost the opposite of the prevailing form.
It is attained and sustained fulfillment, the transparent unity of subject and object, of the universal and the individual, a dynamic rather than, than static unity in which all becoming is free self-externalization, release, and enjoyment of potentialities. The labor of history comes to rest in history. Alienation is canceled, and with it transcendence and the flux of time. The spirit overcomes its temporal form, negates time. But the end of history recaptures its content. The force which accomplishes the conquest of time is remembrance, recollection. Absolute knowledge in which the spirit attains its truth is the spirit entering into its real self, whereby it, abandoned, it abandons its extraneous existence and entrusts its just halt to remembrance. Being is no longer the painful transcendence toward the future, but the peaceful recapture of the past. Remembrance, which has preserved everything that was, is the inner and the actually higher form of the substance. The fact that remembrance here appears as the decisive existential category for the highest form of being indicates the inner trend of Hegel's philosophy. Hegel replaces the idea of progress by that of a cyclical development which moves self-sufficient in the reproduction and consummation of what is. This development presupposes the entire history of man, his subjective and objective world, and the comprehension of his history the remembrance of his past. The past remains present. It is the very life of the spirit, which has been decided, or which has been, decides on what is, or what has been decides on what is. Freedom implies reconciliation, redemption of the past. If the past is just left behind and forgotten, there will be no end to destructive transgression. Somehow the progress of transgression must be arrested. Hegel thought that the wounds of the spirit heal without leaving scars. He believes that, on the attained level of civilization, with the triumph of reason, freedom had become a reality. But neither the state nor society embodies the ultimate form of freedom. No matter how rationally they are organized, they are still afflicted with unfreedom. True freedom is only in the idea. Liberation thus is a spiritual event. Hegel's dialectic remains within the framework set by the established reality principle. Western philosophy ends with the idea with which it began. At the beginning and at the end, in Aristotle and in Hegel, the supreme mode of being, the ultimate form of reason and freedom, appear as new, spirit, geist. At the end and at the beginning, the empirical world remains in negativity, the stuff and the tools of the spirit or of its representatives on earth. In reality, neither remembrance nor absolute knowledge redeems that which was and is. Still, this philosophy testifies not only to the reality principle which governs the empirical world, but also to its negation. The, co the consummation of being is not the ascending curve, but the closing of the circle, the return from alienation. Philosophy could conceive of such a state only as that of pure thought. Between the beginning and the end is the development of reason as the logic of domination, progress through alienation. The repressed liberation is upheld in the idea and in the ideal. After Hegel, the mainstream of Western philosophy is exhausted. The Logos of Domination has built its system, and what follows is epilogue. Philosophy survives as a special and not very vital function in the academic establishment. The new principles of thought develop outside this establishment. They are qualitatively novel and committed to a different form of reason, to a different reality principle. In metaphysical terms, the change is expressed by the fact that the essence of being is no longer conceived as Logos. And with this change in the basic experience of being, the logic of domination is challenged. When Schopenhauer defines the essence of being as will, it shows forth as insatiable want and aggression, which must be redeemed at all cost. To Schopenhauer, they are redeemable only in their absolute negation. Will itself must come to rest to an end. But the ideal of Nirvana contains the affirmation 
the end is fulfillment, gratification. Nirvana is the image of the pleasure principle. As such, it emerges, still in a repressive form, in Richard Wagner's music drama, repressive because, as in any good theology and morality, fulfillment here demands the sacrifice of earthly happiness. The Principium Individuationis itself is said to be at fault. Fulfillment is only beyond its realm. The most orgastic lie bestowed still celebrates the most orgastic renunciation. Only Nietzsche's philosophy surmounts the ontological tradition, but his indictment of the logos as repression and perversion of the will to power is so highly ambiguous that it has often blocked the understanding. First, the indictment itself is ambiguous. Historically, the logos of domination released rather than repressed the will to power. It was the direction of this will that was repressive toward productive renunciation, which made man the slave of his labor and the enemy of his own gratification. Moreover, the will to power is not Nietzsche's last word. Will, this is the liberator and joy bringer. Thus I taught you, my friends. But now this also, this also learn, the will itself is still a prisoner. Will is still a prisoner because it has no power over time. The past not only remains unliberated, but unliberated continues to mar all liberation. Unless the power of time over life is broken, there can be no freedom. The fact that time does not recur sustains the wound of bad conscience. It breeds vengeance and the need for punishment, which in turn perpetuate the past and the sickness to death. With the triumph of Christian morality, the life instincts were perverted and constrained. Bad conscience was linked with a guilt against God. In the human instincts were implanted hostility, rebellion, insurrection against the master, father, the primal ancestor and origin of the world. Repression and deprivation were thus justified and affirmed. They were made into the masterful and aggressive forces which determined the human existence. With their growing social utilization, progress became of necessity progressive repression. On this road, there is no alternative and no spiritual and transcendental freedom can compensate for the repressive foundations of culture. The wounds of the spirit, if they heal at all, do leave scars. The past becomes master over the present and life a tribute to death. And now cloud upon cloud rolled over the spirit until at last madness preached. All things pass away, therefore all things deserve to pass away. And this is justice itself this law of time, that it must devour its children, thus preached madness. Nietzsche exposes the gigantic fallacy on which Western philosophy and morality were built, namely the transformation of facts into essences, of historical into metaphysical conditions. The weakness and despondency of man, the inequality of power and wealth, injustice and suffering were attributed to some transcendental crime and guilt Rebellion became the original sin, disobedience against God, and the striving for gratification was concupis <laughs> concupiscence. <laughs> concupiscence. Moreover, this whole series of fallacies culminated in the deification of time, because everything in the empirical world is passing, man is in his very essence a finite being, and death is in the very essence of life. Only the higher values are eternal and therefore really real. The inner man, faith, and love, which does not ask and does not desire. Nietzsche's attempt to uncover the historical roots of these transformations elucidates their twofold function, to pacify, compensate, and justify the underprivileged of the earth, and to protect those who made and left them underprivileged. The achievement snowballed and enveloped the masters and the slaves, the rulers and the ruled, and that upsurge of productive repression which advanced Western civilization to ever higher levels of efficacy. However, growing efficacy involved growing degeneration of the life instincts, the decline of man. Nietzsche's critique is distinguished from all academic social, social psychology by the position from which it is undertaken. Nietzsche speaks in the name of a reality principle fundamentally antagonistic to that of Western civilization. The traditional form of reason is rejected on the basis 
of the experience of being as end in itself, as joy, lust, and enjoyment. The struggle against time is waged from this position. The tyranny of becoming over being must be broken if man is to come to himself in a world which is truly his own. As long as there is the uncomprehended and unconquered flux of time, senseless loss, the painful, it was, that will never be again, being contains the seed of destruction which perverts good to evil and vice versa. Man comes to himself only when the transcendence has been conquered, when eternity has become present in the here and now. Nietzsche's conception terminates in the vision of the closed circle, not progress, but the eternal return. All things pass, all things return. Eternally turns the wheel of being. All things die, all things blossom again. Eternal is the year of being. All things break, all things are joined anew. Eternally the house of being builds itself the same. All things part, all things welcome each other again. Eternally the ring of being abides by itself. In each now, being begins. Round each here turns the sphere of there. The center is everywhere bent as the path of eternity. The closed circle has appeared before, in Aristotle and Hegel, as the symbol of being as end in itself. But while Aristotle reserved it to the new theos, while Hegel identified it with the absolute idea, Nietzsche envisages the eternal return of the finite exactly as it is, in its full concreteness and finiteness. This is the total affirmation of the life instincts, repelling all escape and negation. The eternal return is the will and vision of an erotic attitude toward being for which necessity and fulfillment coincide. Shield of necessity, star summit of being, not reached by any wish, not soiled by any no. Eternal yes of being, I affirm you eternally for I love you eternity. Eternity, long since the ultimate consolation of an alienated existence, had been made into an instrument of repression by its relegation to a transcendental world, unreal reward for real suffering. Here, eternity is reclaimed for the fair earth as the eternal return of its children, of the lily and the rose, of the sun on the mountains and lakes, of the lover and the beloved, of the fear for their life, of pain and happiness. Death is, it is conquered only if it is followed by the real rebirth of everything that was before death here on earth. Not as a mere repetition, but as willed and wanted recreation. The eternal return thus includes the return of suffering, but suffering as a means for more gratification, for the aggrandizement of joy. The horror of pain derives from the instinct of weakness, from the fact that pain overwhelms and becomes final and fatal. Suffering can be affirmed if man's power is sufficiently strong to make pain a stimulus for affirmation, a link in the chain of joy. The doctrine of the eternal return obtains all its meaning from the central proposition that joy wants eternity, wants itself and all things to be everlasting. Nietzsche's philosophy contains enough elements of the terrible past. His celebration of pain and power perpetuates features of the morality which he strives to overcome. However, the image of a new reality principle breaks the repressive context and anticipates the liberation from the archaic heritage. The earth has all too long been a madhouse. For Nietzsche, the liberation depends on the reversal of the sense of guilt. Mankind must come to associate the bad conscience not with the affirmation, but with the denial of the life instincts, not with the rebellion, but with the acceptance of the repressive ideals. We have suggested certain nodal points in the development of Western philosophy, which reveal the historical limitations of its system of reason and the effort to surpass this system. The struggle appears in the antagonism between becoming and being, between the ascending curve and the closed circle, prog progress and eternal return, transcendence and rest in fulfillment. It is the struggle between the logic of domination and the will to gratification. Both assert their claims for defining the reality principle. The traditional ontology is contested against the conception of being in terms of logos, rises the conception of being in illogical terms, will and joy.
this counter trend strives to formulate its own logos, the logic of gratification. In its most advanced positions, Freud's theory partakes of this philosophical dynamic. His metapsychology attempts to define the essence of being, defines it as eros, in contrast to its traditional definition as logos. The death instead affirms the principle of non-being, the negation of being against eros, the principle of being. The ubiquitous fusion of the two principles in Freud's conception corresponds to the traditional metaphysical uh, fusion of being and non-being. To be sure, Freud's conception of eros refers only to organic life. However, inorganic matter is, as the end of the death instinct, so inherently linked to organic matter that, as suggested above, it seems permissible to give his conception a general ontological meaning. Being is essentially the striving for pleasure. This striving becomes an aim in the human existence. The erotic impulse to combine living substance into ever larger and more durable units is the instinctual source of civilization. The sex instincts are life instincts. The impulse to preserve and enrich life by mastering nature in accordance with the developing vital needs is organically an erotic impulse. Anonk is experienced as the barrier against the satisfaction of the life instincts, which seek pleasure, not security, and the struggle for existence is originally a struggle for pleasure. Culture begins with the collective implementation of this aim. Later, however, the struggle for existence is organized in the interest of domination. The erotic basis of culture is transformed. When philosophy conceives the essence of being as logos, it is already the logos of domination. Commanding, mastering, directing reason to which man and nature are to be subjected. Freud's interpretation of being in terms of eros recaptures the early stage of Plato's philosophy, which conceived of culture not as the repressive sublimation, but as the free self-development of eros. As early as Plato, this conception appears as an archaic mythical residue. Eros is being absorbed into Logos, and Logos is reason, which subdues the instincts. The history of ontology reflects the reality principle which governs the world ever more exclusively. The insights contained in the metaphysical notion of Eros were driven underground. They survived in eschato eschatological distortion and many heretic movements, in the hedonistic philosophy. Their history has still to be written, as has the history of the transformation of Eros in Agape. Freud's own theory follows the general trend. In his work, the rationality of the predominant reality principle supersedes the metaphysical speculations on Eros. We shall presently try to recapture the full content of his speculations.